This gleaming collection of elegant glass-sided skyscrapers marks the skyline of one of the world's great cities. Can you name it? It's Moscow. Now on a map, it looks uncannily like a dartboard, a bullseye. And right in the center of that bullseye is the Kremlin, that ancient red-walled fortress that for 74 years, one month, and 19 days sent nerve impulses out to the farthest region of what is by far the largest country in the world, Russia. Eight and a half million square miles covering 11 time zones. It's fully one sixth of the world's surface. And of course, those impulses extended much further even than that. For the lion's share of that awful, bloody 20th century, the reach of the men inside these red walls extended throughout all of Europe and Asia. Tendrils of power that also extended across Africa and then took root in the Western Hemisphere, throughout South and Central America, and finally terminating in Cuba, just 90 miles away from that other great post-war superpower, whose capital was not made out of red brick, but rather white marble. Now, here at the heart of Red Square sits a red granite bunker, a graceless, brooding mausoleum as different from the tranquil, open, soaring majesty of the Lincoln Monument as the men themselves and the countries that they had led. Now, in the dead center of this dismal, windowless tomb sits a black marble coffin surrounded by blood-red tiles and what appear to be blood-red lightning bolts, some bizarre electric spasm of fear spreading out to the four corners of the earth. And there, at the precise geometric center of this socialist sarcophagus, he lies to this day, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, five feet, five inches tall, and better known as Lenin, a graven image to be worshiped by a godless state, the unburied corpse of an empire of unimaginable terror. Now, put a pin, an imaginary pin, right in the center of that massively famous forehead. From that point, Walk 2,829 feet, that's almost exactly half a mile, to the north-northeast, and you will be able to touch this building, the Lubyanka. It's painted a bright, sunny yellow, looks positively cheerful in broad daylight, almost like a toy store. It's not, though. The toy store is the third building on the left, the one with those rounded archways. It's about 300 feet from the toy store to the center of the Lubyanka, so let's say a football field, which frankly seems a little too close for comfort, at least for me. You see that bright yellow cheerful building is currently the home of the Russian FSB, the Federal Security Service, Russia's secret police. Here's their insignia. You can see that it has retained the same dagger and shield motif as its prior incarnation, the KGB. Before that, it was the NKVD, and before that, the GPU, and before the GPU came the original article, the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission, known by its acronym in Russia as the Cheka. All of the Soviet secret police agencies were headquartered here in the Lubyanka. From December of 1958 through August of 1991, stood a statue of the founder of the Cheka, Felix Zerzhinsky, otherwise known as Iron Felix, for his stalwart vigilance and unbending ruthlessness. Felix Zerzhinsky was not the founder of the terror state. That distinction belongs to Comrade Lenin half a mile behind us, and his most devoted and capable disciple, of course, who would go on to add other refinements that neither Lenin nor Iron Felix could have imagined. Zerzhinsky wasn't the founder of the state terror, but he was the architect of it. It was Iron Felix acting at Lenin's behest who started to gather innocent men, mostly men, and bring them by night through the back gate of the Lubyanka, and then, six at a time, he would walk these naked men and women across wooden planks covering a floor that is covered with bloody, freezing water. To stand up against six wooden doors that were inset a little bit from the massive stone walls of the Lubyanka. Now these doors had no hinges because these doors never opened. Each one of the naked, shivering, crying people could see the bullet holes right in front of their faces. 
The wooden doors were there to prevent ricochets from hitting the Czechists, the Czechisti in the local vernacular, standing 10 feet behind the people, facing those blood-splattered bullet holes, each wearing a leather trench coat, and each of them holding a Nagant M1895 revolver, an ugly little pistol that may just possibly have murdered more human beings than any other single weapon in history. Now, just off to the side, another Czechist would stand with a thin wooden stick like a pointer. And when everybody was in place, he would lower that pointer, at which point six 38 caliber bullets would smash into the backs of the heads of six human beings, and usually out through the front of the head as well, through the thin wooden doors that had no hinges, stopping just after their short journey against the massive stone walls of the basement. A few feet behind the men in leather coats was a small set of rails. A wooden cart would be pushed forward, and the six men would pile the bodies onto the cart while the seventh hosed off the six doors, hence the freezing pink water in the wooden planks. Iron Felix and his Czechists had discovered, just through trial and error, really, that standing with your nose three inches away from fresh blood and brain matter would sometimes cause some or all of the six innocent people to panic and that could get messy, and more importantly, it could slow down the operation. They used wooden doors rather than simple plywood, because by the time the people standing naked in front of them realized that the doors had no hinges, the man holding the pointer would drop his hand and that'd be the end of that. The cart with the six pale white bodies would get wheeled a little further down the hall to where other Czechists would tie the feet together with a rope and then manually haul them up to the inner, secret, hidden courtyard of the Lubyanka. They would then be laid out in the flat beds of trucks, and when the pile got high enough, they'd throw a tarp over the bodies, and they weren't too particular about this either. Having common citizens see a hand or a foot sticking out would produce exactly the kind of effect that Iron Felix had promised Lenin. Now, meanwhile, of course, more innocent names had been called in the holding cells of the Lubyanka. More people stripped naked and forced to walk across wooden planks over freezing pink water and stand in front of six doors with no hinges while they waited until the man holding the wooden stick was ready. The amplified blaring of Soviet martial music intending but not succeeding in blotting out the gunshots and especially the screaming from behind. Now, we don't know how many innocent people were actually killed here, because just a few blocks to the north, two-tenths of a mile, it's about a five-minute walk, is this unassuming building with this unremarkable gate. This is 11 Ulitsa Bolshaya Lubyanka, and it's still owned by the FSB, the direct descendant of the original owners. There's a little courtyard on the other side of that iron gate. It's not a large space. Night after night, the Cheka's Black Marias, the prison buses, essentially mobile cages with the windows welded over with thin steel plate, they rolled through this narrow gate and the best estimate is about 15,000 people went in through that gate, but they did not come back out again. They were shot right here out in the open in this tiny courtyard while the Czechisti revved up the Black Marias so they were loud enough to cover the sound of the gunfire and of course the screaming. Now, should Dzerzhinsky or any other of his Czechisti decide that they didn't want to make the five minute walk all the way up to the courtyard, they could instead emerge from the Lubyanka and head in the other direction towards the south. A three minute walk would bring them to this location, 23 Nikolskaya Street. Now, as we record this, the building is covered by this huge decorative tarp since it's being renovated in order to house an upscale retail perfume store. But this building, Here's what it looked like before the renovation. Was known to Moscovites simply as the shooting house. On the floors behind the cloth curtain you see here, just a few feet away, 31,436 people were sentenced to death and almost all of those people were executed right here, right inside this building. Here's one page out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other pages exactly like it with 27 names on it. Now, each one of these human beings went into what would eventually become a luxury perfume retail establishment. They underwent a trial that generally lasted about 10 to 15 minutes, 
were found guilty of crimes against Soviet power, and then every one of these 27 people were shot in the back of the head right here. How many people enjoying a Starbucks coffee on these benches know what went on inside that building? How many want to know? I'm Bill Whittle, and this is an Empire of Terror.